Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good morning. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Chris Sattler from Princeton University to uh, come here today to give a talk. And Chris is graduating uh, for his PhD from the E department of Princeton. And uh, to my opinion, he has a very exciting PhD project. Um, uh, I don't know how often do you get to go to Kenya and, and uh, shoot zebras legally. Uh, in your PhD, but uh, Chris did that twice. Uh, his talk was probably not going to focus on the zebra net, but on the energy conservation techniques in mobile delay tolerant sensor networks. Okay, Chris. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming today. So, yes, so today uh, my main objective is to talk about some of the energy conservation techniques that I've been working on um, for my PhD dissertation. And Really where I want to start off is just to, is just to give a general broad view of the problems uh, and, and the sensor areas that I concentrate on. Um, and really what it boils down to when you start to look at this, we want, we, we want sensor networks, low power computers, to be able to sense environmental variables in ways humans cannot. And for this we're talking about long lifetimes of fine grain autonomous sensing. However, at the same time, we need any sensing devices to be unobtrusive so that they don't change uh, the environmental variables being sensed. And we often want them to function in harsh environments or areas where they're going to be completely inaccessible and won't have any fixed infrastructure. So this means we need wireless sensor to sensor communication in order to get data out and to a place where humans can interact with it and interpret it. But it also means that nodes are going to operate off of batteries and energy scavenged from the environment. Now, this leads to two primary sensor challenges. The first having to do with uh, the need for a strong energy conservation. And also, when the, the types of networks that I'm going to be looking at primarily today, or, or just in general for my, th for my thesis, are um, sparse mobile networks, where communications are extremely unreliable and energy intensive. Now, I'll come back to the communications, but let's look a little bit at energy conservation and where things work in the sensor field in general. Um, Primarily sensors, you know, the, the, the two primary um, energy conservation techniques they use is they use uh, uh, major resource uh, constrained components and they also typically use intensive duty cycle control. Now for resource constrained components we're looking at uh, a very low power microcontroller, something operating in the kilohertz to megahertz with just kilobytes of RAM. Um, you also typically use non-volatile memory, uh, flash memory specifically, so that it's not consuming any energy when it's turned off. Uh, and then these are run on the intense duty cycle where they're kept off as long as possible. Like whenever we're not using it, try to keep it off. However, if you look at the deployments that have, that have been done in the field, this has proven not to be enough. Um, the lifetimes of more than a month or two have been rare when you start looking at fine grain sensing and periodic transmissions. Um, and given the, the, the constraints of these systems, what we really need are novel energy conservation techniques tailored to sensors. Now, to drive this point home, I'll pull up ZebraNet, which is, uh, we deployed a, a sparse mobile network of GPS-enabled collars to track animal migrations in ways that just were not possible before. Um, yeah, we've been out twice, and uh, we've been out to, Princeton actually owns part of Kenya. So we went out to Princeton-owned Kenya and, uh, and put out just a handful of collars that, are, uh, that, that periodically interact um, flood information from collar to collar and can propagate information back across the network. Now, given the high energy peripheral that we're talking about with the GPS and the high energy of radio communications, um, wh what, we, what we saw, at least in the lab, was that we were only going to see about three to five days for, for, for this to work with, without a, on just a battery without any type of recharge. Um, so we added solar cells to the outsides of the collars in an effort to, uh, to essentially give us indefinite lifetime. But one of the things that we saw rather quickly is that the solar cells degraded over time. Um, they got scratched. They got dust. Um, there was damage. So what this meant was that the amount of energy available on day one was not the same as the amount of energy available toward the end of the deployment. And what this means is that energy still governs the longevity of the deployment regardless of whether or not um, you have some sort of um, recharge. Um, 
And now to kind of to, to, to kind of concentrate a little, so we need the, these energy conservation techniques. We have to look at where the energy is going. And on our system, we actually constrained the maximum amount of time that nodes could communicate. But even with this, we still saw that well over half of the energy was going to the radio. Um, additionally, what we saw was that communications were extremely unreliable. Um, it just in the unreliability, just the reality of the situation. And um, and, and we'll, we'll go into this in a minute here, but essentially we saw a lot of, a lot of reception rates in uh, 25 to 50 percent packet successes. So we're talking, uh, you need to send two to four packets just to get one across correctly. And a lot of asymmetric communications, which essentially means you have two collars talking to each other, one can hear the other one really well, the other can't. It's very sporadic. Um, so if you look at, 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 at why, I mean, this translates to just... Uh, I mean, sorry, if you look at why this is the case, a lot of this has to do with topology changes. Um, you lose line of sight, the antenna's close to ground, you have fading, uh, uh, fading and attenuation effects, antenna damage. Um, and this is present in uh, stationary networks as well, but in stationary networks you can take steps to try to mitigate some of these factors through intelligent antenna placement, node placement. Um, but in, in the, none of these metrics are available in your standard mobile systems. Additionally, when you start looking at sparse networks, you have an additional challenge, um, and that is that they're going to require delay tolerance. They're typically going to be isolated, and communications are going to come in uh, an opportunistic fashion. You know, when they, when, when they finally see another neighbor, it's going to be a peer-to-peer -peer link. There's going to be bursts of communications. This means longer radioactive periods, and this makes that com communication in mobile systems more energy intensive than what you'd see in a stationary system. So, Really, the primary effort uh, that, that I see that we have to, to conserve energy, we need to minimize communications and make necessary communications more efficient. Um, less communication, that, that, you know, the less communication, the, uh, the better, and make it as a, the limited communication as effective as possible. This is emphasized when you start looking at some of the current sensor trends. Um, the microcontroller and the flash memory, you know, the microcontroller is getting more capable, flash memory is getting uh, increased storage capacity. The energy of both these uh, modules is, is going down. But the, the radio has remained expensive and unreliable due to a lot of the facts that I discussed in the last slide. Additionally, there has been an increased research focus on, on sensor networks where nodes are uh, individually important, especially when you start looking at sparse networks, uh, mobile networks. And a lot of this has to do with just the uh, logistical um, cost of deploying large numbers of nodes and the environmental impacts of scattering batteries uh, in, in, in that you're not planning on recovering. So given, given this, my thesis explores energy conservation techniques for this emerging domain of sensors. And we're, I'm emphasizing making communications more efficient. And I've looked at this through various areas of the system, um, and all sorts of systems optimizations. Today's main topic is going to be application level compression. Um, compression, we can just kind of snap on to the end to essentially just uh, minimize the amount of data that needs to be communicated. I also will talk some about today about um, data organization at the network level. How can we reorganize data in a way to make it easier to transmit? Um, I'm not going to talk today about some more system specific energy management techniques, although I'd be happy to talk about that uh, later. But essentially, what it comes down to is that with limited uh, sensor resources, it often becomes necessary or desirable to take a um, more, more system-specific approach to energy management um, through cross-layer optimizations, through optimization uh, um, based on particular hardware uh, to save energy. So at this point, let's look at application-level compression and um, uh, kind of move on to, 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 to that, which will be the main focus of the talk. This, this work was originally presented in uh, Census back in November. Um, so, as I transition to this, why do we care about compression in sensor networks? And uh, so, and, and given what we, given what we've talked about, I, I mean, since the flash is becoming uh, increasingly ca uh, capable, my primary concern here is not actually saving space; it's saving energy. And what we're looking at here is a computation communication trade-off. Um, and what this, this, this you talk, when you're talking about energy, you're talking about the cost of transmitting all the data versus the cost, the cost of compression in transmitting a smaller amount of data. And what this graph over here shows on the y-axis, you have the MSP430, uh, standard sensor network microcontroller running at about 4 megahertz. Um, how many clock cycles can you get for the same energy as transmitting one byte over three different uh, radios that have been popular with sensor networks? Um, we have a logarithmic scale because it, it varies 
um, widely. And the picture actually changes depending on the hardware. So if you can spend, okay, no, sorry, I'll, I'll label this uh, ETX byte, the amount of energy, um, that, the, the amount of energy it costs to transmit a byte versus a uh, computation. And I'll come back to this when, when I start looking at it again in about 15 slides or so. But um, the trade-off that I'm trying to show here essentially is that if you can spend a thousand clock cycles or so to reduce your, uh, to, to reduce your sensors, I mean, your data size by one byte, it's going to be worth it pretty much on any radio because um, you're going to spend less energy to compress the data than you are to just transmit the byte. Um, however, as this number increases, the picture becomes more cloudy. If you have to spend about 4,000 cycles to reduce um, the data size by one byte, it might not be worth it on your short range radio. About 32,000 for a medium range radio, something in the 300 meter range. For a long range radio, like what we used on ZebraNet, um, it's, around, it, it's closer to 2 million. Now, if it's going to cost more than that, does that mean that you shouldn't compress? Well, to, for this, you actually have to look at the entire system. We've looked at, you know, th this is more of an ideal situation. Um, but we had talked about unreliability. And you start talking about unreliability, retransmissions actually change the picture because you pay the cost of compression once. And, um, uh, but with, when you start having to retransmit, you have to pay the cost to send a byte multiple times. And what this graph shows, if we zoom in on the medium range radio, um, the y-axis is the same as before, but I've moved to a, uh, a linear scale because we're zooming in on one radio. The x-axis is percentage of packets received correctly. Essentially, at 100%, every packet gets there. At 25%, only one in four is arriving uh, correctly. Um, and what you can see is that the, uh, as we start dropping packets, it becomes worth spending more energy on compression itself. Additionally, we have to take a look at this from a network perspective. So right now, we've talked about what I will call today the local energy trade-off, um, which is the cost of transmitting all the data versus the cost of compressing that data, storing it, and uh, transmitting it in its compressed version. However, as you start to relay this through a network, what you find is that downstream, they don't have to, the other nodes don't necessarily have to pay the cost of compression. Um, they're just relaying the data, and it's just the cost of relaying all the data versus relaying the compressed data, and ideally the compressed data will be smaller than the, uh, than the rest of it. Additionally, as this passes through the network, the savings accumulate with hop count. And this is why we, can, we care about compression, because we can save energy both locally on the compressing node and throughout the entire network. Now, the work in general um, in, in the, 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 this chapter of my thesis, the goal was to propose and evaluate a family of lossless compression algorithms that have been tailored to sensors, and then looking at additional steps of, uh, of of changing the compression algorithm and transforming the data to further reduce energy. And then I kind of go on to evaluate the downstream energy benefits of compression and on, on both the, you know, on all the subsequent nodes that are receiving and relaying this data. Now I don't have time to talk about all of that today, for this portion of the talk at least. So what I want to concentrate on is di design criteria. What are we looking for when we talk about sensor compression? And um, we settled on LZW. So how do we take this LZW algorithm and adapt it to sensors? Then I'll talk about how we actually use compression to conserve energy and, and how this is reflected in the system. And then I'll conclude uh, this portion of the talk. So let's start with the design criteria. What do we, what do we really want? Um, and we start talking about this. Essentially, sensor compression can, uh, can help everyone. Um, sparse mobile networks, like the ones that I've concentrated on primarily, but even on, uh, on, on general stationary networks. And what we want is just a, a family of general purpose lossless compression algorithms, which work across the design space, something that we can just kind of snap onto the application um, and just start saving energy. And we want this to work on all types of data, from, like, yeah, for, from very consistent data, indoor stationary data that you might see through um, uh, th through data that's somewhat variable, uh, that, you, that, that, that might come from an outdoor stationary network, or even data that's highly variable, like on ZebraNet, when we had nodes attached to, I mean, the collars, we didn't know, I mean, th there were, and there's no correlation between one, re one reading and the next. Um, so we take a step back, and let's, so let's see what's actually, what is actually available. Um, what, what, what's, what's available in the field? Well, a couple years back, Baran Asanovich um, over at MIT had eva actually evaluated the, com the, compression, the, sorry, the energy of compression algorithms on PDAs. However, when they did it, they were really looking at a different problem. They were talking about compressing megabytes of text data and web data. They were looking at PDAs, which are far more capable than the sensors that I'm discussing today. Um, 
So these these uh, these uh, answers didn't translate directly to uh, the sensor. Uh, I mean to sensor nodes and to sensor data. So you have to look more along the lines of what's going on um, in terms of sensors. And there's two interrelated buckets uh, of uh, um, of work that concentrates on compressing on sensor data. And the first one is compression algorithms that exploit high data correlation. This is like wavelet compression, source coding. Uh, and the issue with these is that they, 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 they try to exploit the high correlation among a, a dense group of nodes um, to reduce the data. But on a lot of the networks that we're looking at, especially when you start looking at mobile networks, um, the deployments might not exhibit the, the necessary correlation to make these techniques feasible. Now, in the second related bucket is data reduction and data-centric routing and aggregation, where essentially data is routed along a path back to a sink. Um, uh, and along the way, it's reduced and there's aggregation mechanisms going on. Um, and this is like your directed diffusion type work. And again, this requires some sort of data correlation um, that, that for, for, for an effective aggregation, which may not exist. But the other thing is that it becomes difficult to move uncompressed data to the aggregating node. Um, because you have to move it from the source to these aggregated nodes in an uncompressed fashion. So if those aren't the answer, what are we really looking for? Um, well, I'm not a compression expert, I, but I do know essentially you know, the, 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 types, the, the types of um, mechanisms that we're going to want on the sensor to actually help us save energy. And one is we want a low transmission overhead. I don't want to spend more information, to, I mean, sorry, more energy telling the decoder how to decode my compressed block then I actually save by compressing the data and, and sending it in its compressed form. It needs to be computationally simple so I don't spend more energy compressing the data than I would just send transmitting it uncompressed. It needs to have a bounded memory footprint so that it works on our sensors. And I want it to be adaptive so that it can work on pretty much any type of, um, you know, uh, any type of application. So what I, what I settled on was LZW. And LZW is a dictionary-based algorithm that encodes new strings based on previous enc previously encountered strings. And part of, the, part of the reason I said all that, one of the beauties of this is that because the, uh, the source, the, gener uh, the generating node, um, compressing node, is building the dictionary on the fly, the receiver can do the same thing. It rebuilds the dictionary on the fly, so there's no need to, there's no need to transmit it, so there's no transmission overhead. Um, additionally, it's got a small energy cost, which I'll show when we start talking about uh, compression energy, a few slides. Um, it's got a bounded memory footprint because you can fix the dictionary size. And it's adaptive since it's exploiting repetition in the input stream to compress the data. However, um, the LZW that you typically find on your Linux systems or your desktop systems is designed to compress megabytes of data. Um, it's designed to, uh, designed to compress huge blocks of data more along the lines of text. Um, and we need to actually adapt this. So this is not this, so we need to come up with an algorithm that's, that's not exactly what we're looking at on desktop. Something that'll actually work on our sensors. So how do we adapt LZW to sensors? That's that, that's the next question. And there are a lot of key um, categories that, we'll, that that I look at in the work um, in terms of dictionary decisions and, uh, and and data decisions. And they combine to form SLZW, which is my version of LZW designed for sensors. Now. In terms of dictionary decisions, we, have to, we, we want to look at how large do we make the dictionary, what do we do when the dictionary fills. Um, and in the interest of time, I'm going to kind of reserve these for the thesis, for the paper, um, which is available on my website. Um, but I'm, I'll kind of touch on them a little bit along the way. But really, I want to spend my time to concentrate on the data decisions. Um, first of all, how much data should we compress at once? Um, and then how can we shape the dictionary to improve compression? And how can we shape the data to make it easier to compress? Now, when we look at how much data we should compress at once, you have kind of a balancing mechanism. Longer data streams will give you better compression learning and possibly um, uh, you know, excuse, excuse me, improve the compression itself. However, the issue um, which you may have picked up but I hadn't really discussed yet was that since you're encoding uh, new strings based on previously encountered strings, if you lose data at the, begin the beginning of the compressed block, you can't decompress the data at the end of the compressed block. So if it becomes, so if the streams become too long, there's a high, really high retransmit cost, and then you and you can, in the worst case scenario, is you lose a lot of data. So the first uh, the first idea behind SLZW is how do we balance this? And the way we did it was that we took the sensor data, which has been accumulating over time, and we broke it down into about 500 byte blocks. 528 bytes just had to do with the flash module that we we're using. We were trying to work in increments of the flash page. But 
and, and so, but generally, you were talking around the neighborhood of 500, pay, uh, 500 byte blocks. And we took these blocks and pushed them through the compression algorithms independently. And what this did was created independent blocks of compressed data. Um, and there, there are a couple benefits to, to, to this. First of all, since you have such small blocks of compressed data, it fits in just a handful of packets, and that makes it easy to transmit through the network. Additionally, if you lose a packet, the absolute worst case scenario is that you're going to lose, in this case, 528 bytes of data. You're not actually, you don't, you don't have to worry about losing, uh, you know, days and days of sensor data. It's not going to be a, uh, um, a, a total loss. But additionally, and the last main benefit is that because we're using such small blocks, we're able to use a nice small um, dictionary size. We actually use 512 entry dictionary, and that makes it easy and, and manageable to fit on our sensor microcontrollers. So now that we have this, is there anything that we can actually do to the dictionary um, to, to help improve compression, to, to help us save additional energy? Um, and one of the things that we noticed was that that sensors have an extremely fine grain locality in terms of their sensor data. Um, you know, it, 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 for, for, for a lot of the times, even, I mean, for, for a lot of the different sensors at least, you have got, uh, you know, one reading might be based off the other, that in, it, in, in certain situations. Um, and we can actually exploit that. If we take this dictionary tree that we've got, um, which is nine bits for a 512 entry dictionary, we can actually just create a mini cache, essentially a second smaller dictionary alongside of it that can encode recently created and recently used entries. Um, and the idea behind this is that if we've encountered an entry, we put it in the mini cache. If it's there, that's great. It's a smaller dictionary. We encode it in fewer bits. We save many bits. But if it's not there, we just need a one bit escape character to move back to the main dictionary. And so it's not a large penalty. Um, also, given this dictionary format, is there, uh, the next question was, is there anything we can do to the data itself to help, us, uh, to help us improve our, our compression. Um, and the answer that we started looking at um, data transforms, ways to essentially uh, manipulate the data into a, compressible, uh, into a more compressible form. Um, one of the ones that we looked at was the Burrow Wheeler's transform, um, which is popular, has been used in BZIP2. Essentially, it's a reversible method of transforming data that uses sorting, um, a, a reversible sorting mechanism to, uh, to, to rearrange things. Um, and that's applicable for all data. Uh, and, it, and it's, a, it's a nice addition to uh, SLZW, but the sorting mechanism is actually fairly high computational cost that I'll, that I'll show later. But one of the things that we saw is that a lot of sensors, and I mean, not, not all of them, but a, a good deal of sensors, actually, when they turn on, they take a given number of sensor readings that are a given size every single time. And if you can take these group of readings and, and form them into rows of a matrix, what we can do, um, what we can do, what we find is that um, because of some of the correlation, a lot of times in 16, 32-bit readings, the most significant bytes are identical um, or very close. And what we can do is we can just transpose this matrix. We create a matrix based on these readings, transpose it, and this gives us runs of characters which are easier to compress. So based on this, this is the, I've talked a lot about compression. Now let's talk about some more about the, uh, the cooler aspect. How can we actually use compression to save energy? That's, that's, really, that, that's really why I did this. It's really why we're here. Um, and I want to look, I'll start looking at the local and downstream energy effects. I'll look at the influence of unreliable communications. And then I'll talk some about the effects of the data shaping that I just talked about. Um, so, all right, let's start, let, let, let's start by looking at, at local energy. Uh, actually, before we look at local energy, let's look at the, the, the methodology. Um, what did I actually do? Um, what was the setup? Well, essentially what I took was a... Uh, uh, the MSP430 microcontroller, which has got 10K of RAM, 48K of program memory, it was connected to a, a 4 megabit alt mill flash, which is the, the flash mechanism used in the ZebraNet, the original ZebraNet hardware, and is what is used on the uh, Mica 2s. Um, it's slightly older technology, but, uh, it, it, and the technology is improving there. Um, and then I kind of uh, looked at three different radios, the short, medium, and, uh, and long range radios that I talked about at the very beginning of, uh, of this section of the talk. And then with this, I looked at um, three real-world data sets and one benchmark. Um, sensor scope, which came from EPFL, is an indoor stationary network with very consistent data. It's, fairly, it, it's, a, it's the easiest of our data sets to compress. Um, Great Duck Island, which was conducted by um, UC Berkeley. They put um, nodes outside and, uh, uh, to do habitat monitoring off the coast of Maine. Um, that's got somewhat consistent data. It's more, it, it's more variable um, than sensor scope. And then on the, uh, the most difficult to compress side for, um, 
uh, for our real world data sets was ZebraNet, which was outdoor mobile data. And so the GPS data in this, it was a combination of GPS and debugging data. And the GPS data had already been compressed with an application specific mechanism. Uh, and essentially the idea uh, of using SLZW here is that we can tag it onto the end and um, you know, uh, tag it on the back of the application and possibly save additional energy. Um, additionally, to kind of offset these, kind of give another baseline framework, I looked at um, GEO from a Calgary corpus. And that is a, um, it's a, it's a well-known benchmark that is notoriously difficult to, de to compress. And it's composed of um, four byte seismic readings. Uh, which is something that you could reasonably get on a sensor node. So to come up with this, what I essentially took was I started by doing timing measurements. How long does it take to do the compression? And, this can tra and, and we can use this to uh, essentially build a model to translate into um, the energy consumption of compression. And essentially I had a PC which was just loading code. It was used to verify results. It was connected to a ZebraNet test node, which is running the devices we just, uh, uh, the, the microcontroller and flash we just talked about. And then an oscilloscope was just used to record timings. It was an independent third party um, that we knew wouldn't affect any of the readings. So you just kind of just flip a, a, a flip, flip a bit to run the compression algorithm. When it comes back in the compression algorithm, uh, flip it back. And then with these timing measurements, I went and actually did a lot of power measurements and evaluation. So I started with the test nodes. We kind of cut these up. We used current sense resistors. And this was hooked up to a data acquisition unit, which could actually measure power. And I measured the power of the microcontroller, the flash operations, reads and writes, of the radio operations, transmitting data, um, first packet versus subsequent packets, which is actually significantly different on a long range radio. Um, I measured all of these, and this kind of it was fed back into a PC. And then this became the model. This was converted to a model that accounted for all the CPU, flash, and radio energy, including transmit and uh, receives. And, and that was what, was what I used to get the energy. Now, this is pumped back into, uh, you know, it, it, this, is pump, this is pumped in the model, and this is where I get these graphs for my local uh, energy savings, which here I'm looking at um, a, a, a short range radio and the, and the long range radio. And this is the, 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 and these values right here are normalized to the cost of just sending the data without any compression whatsoever. Hmm, excuse me. And as you can see, we're looking at uh, a composition of um, CPU flash data and radio energy for the, um, from, from the local node. So this is the cost to compress, store it, and then to transmit the compressed data. Uh, and the first thing I want to note is that on the long range radio, which had a, like a 2 million to 1 um, cycle, to, uh, um, uh, cycle to transmit energy ratio, um, we see huge energy savings across the board. The CPU and the flash energy don't even come into play. Um, we get, we, and we get a nice 2.6x energy gain on the easiest to compress data set and even see nice modest gains on the most difficult to compress data sets. Now as we move over to the short range radio, the picture changes somewhat. So we see a... Uh, 1.7x gain when we look at our easiest to compress data set. But as we move across to the, to the, um, the second, you know, the, our, our mid-range data set and our harder to compress data sets, we actually see losses. We see about a 1% loss here on the Great Duck Island data set and 15 plus percent energy losses on our, uh, on our more difficult to compress data sets. So what does this mean? Does this mean that we shouldn't compress? Well, we can't. We have to actually take take a step back and, and take a look at a network view and look at you know realistic networks um, and the effect of downstream energy as well. So, if we zoom in here on the ZebraNet data, which had about a 15% loss, we zoom in on the short range radio um, where, where we saw that loss. And I've got two graphs here, and they actually these graphs, the lines look identical. They are identical. It's just two ways of showing the same information. Um, the, the left side here is just raw energy savings in joules. The right side here is just your, is that ETX bytes that I mentioned a while ago. It's the it's the uh, the energy required to send. I mean, um, the energy required to send a byte over the radio. So, um, at this first at this first data point, um, with a hop count of one, which just means the compressing no, the node is compressing this your local energy savings. So the node is compressing it and sending it to a base station. There's an there's an energy loss. But as soon as we start start hopping, um, we get to uh, as soon as there's one relay node, we're actually saving energy overall in the network. And this increases linearly with hop count. And by the time we get up to four energy nodes, uh, sorry, four, energy, four, four hops, three relay nodes, we're actually saving the equivalent of sending 1,000 bytes of data through this network in terms of energy. Now, given the downstream energy savings, we should also take a look at, um, 
at unreliability. And uh, you know what happens when you have to start retransmitting data. So this graph is again on the on the short range radio. We're looking at uh, the uh, y axis is ETX bytes from zero to thirty thousand, and um, each of these lines. Each of these 10 lines here represents a different network size. So the very bottom line is one hop, which is just uh, compressing nodes straight to the base station. The top line is 10 hops, compressing nodes through nine relays to the base station. And to ground you a little bit, what you should see is that the energy savings still are increasing linearly with hop count. Now, on the x-axis, now uh, we, we, we're, we're back to the um, average packet delivery success rate. So on the far left side, you have 100% of the packets get there uh, uh, successfully, which is what we had saw on the, on the previous graphs. Um, no retransmissions uh, are necessary. By the far right side of the graph, you're looking at 25%. So only one out of every four actually make it. And one thing to notice is that as soon as we start dropping packets, we start saving energy locally. Um, but the big, the, the big uh, uh, point to make here is that when we start looking at what I actually saw in ZebraNet, what I saw in a real deployment, and, what, and what's been seen in a lot of other real deployments, this 25 to 50 percent packet delivery uh, success rate, we actually see huge energy savings, even on, even on, uh, on one-hop networks. So once we start factoring in the network and the reliability, compression helps a lot. So from here, I want to talk a, a little bit about um, our, uh, the transforms to, to improve performance, which, which I talked about before. I talked about BWT, and I talked about the uh, st uh, structured transform, the matrix transpose. Um, now, for BWT, what you saw was that we had a reversible trans uh, method of uh, transforming data by sorting it. This was the one that was used in BZIP, too. And you, we used an iterative quick sort algorithm, which was just something that could run on a sensor node. You don't want stack growth or anything going out crazy when you only have 10K of RAM. But it comes at a high computational cost. When you start looking at what you see on the short range radio, about 50% of your energy is going into actually um, transforming and compressing the data. Or 50%, oh, sorry, 50 of the energy required just to transmit the data without compression. Um, but when we start looking at the extend radio, the long range radio, which had the 2 million to 1 um, ratio, what we see is significant energy savings um, when we look at the easiest to compress data set and also nice 7-8% improvement on the, uh, on, on the two more difficult to compress real world data sets. And what this tells us is that on these longer range radios, it's definitely worth spending more, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's definitely worth spending more energy to compress the data um, because, because of the ratio, because it costs so much more to transmit a byte. But now we can move from here and look at the, the structured transpose, which, was the, uh, the, 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 which is a much simpler algorithm. Just fill the matrix with, with uh, readings, which, uh, which have to be taken at a, I mean, assuming that the readings, are, when the node comes on, it takes a given number of readings, and the readings are a given size. Um, fill the matrix, and then transpose it to create runs. Um, the advantage of this is extremely simple. The matrix transpose is a trivial operation. The disadvantage is it wasn't applicable to all of our data sets, since ZebraNet had had a combination of GPS data that had been previously compressed and debug data. I couldn't create this matrix, so I could only uh, create it with the, uh, the other three data sets. However, when you look at those data sets, we see significant energy savings across the board. And compared to sending the data without, um, sending the data without any compression at all, we were looking at 4.5x energy savings. Um, when we looked at the easiest to compress data set. So, I've talked a lot about compression, compression energy, so what's the answer? Well, um, the answer is that some compression almost always helps. But the ideal solution is that we really need a family of compression algorithms. And we have to take into account a number of factors when we start looking at what, what, what the more ideal compression algorithms for our system. Um, and one of them has to do with the data co uh, composition, uh, structured versus general. Can we use that structured transpose? Um, if we can, and, and we also have to look at um, what is the network size. On a small network, it's easier to, I mean, on, on a small network, the local energy cost is a, a weighs higher than in a large network that has a lot of relay nodes. Um, and we have to also look at the radio range. And actually, when we looked at a short range radio on a small network, that actually had the structure transpose, the right answer turned out to be a RLE, just a simple run length encoding, um, which I didn't talk about today just in the interest of time. Um, but really, we wanted the simplest method possible, so we didn't spend a lot of compute uh, energy uh, to, uh, to actually uh, do the compression. Um, on the unstructured data, we can't do that. We don't get our runs of characters, so we just use the simplest LZW algorithm that we can and uh, move from there. But 
as the radio range increases, um, what we see is that it's worth spending more, uh, uh, more cycles to compress and having a more versatile compression algorithm that can, exploit, um, uh, that, that can exploit more repetition and the data is beneficial. So we start using uh, LZW variants. And we see the same type of things when we start looking at large, at large networks. Um, at that point, the radio range doesn't matter because the, the downstream energy is a higher percentage overall. It's worth spending more at the, at, at the local node to save energy on nodes closer to the sink. So to conclude this section of the talk, um, yeah, success in, energy, in, in centric compression is a metric of energy savings, not, com, not, not, not a compression ratio. And I still want to reemphasize the fact that some amount of compression almost always saves you energy. Um, even if you don't have the ideal solution, just plugging in a compression algorithm is going to help um, it's, it, it, in most realistic network uh, uh, situations. Um, SLZW, which I proposed, can reduce energy consumption by over 1.5x. And simple data transforms can improve energy savings to more than 2.5x. And then these energy savings multiply as nodes start having to retransmit it as the network grows. Shouldn't the compression algorithm also be a function of the loss rate, right, of the unreliability? So more unreliable a medium, you might want to change the packet size or basically apply different compression algorithms based on the amount of reliability in the network. Have you explored that? Okay, so, so, so your question is, um, sh should we factor um, loss rate into, in, into compression? Yeah. And um, I think the, uh, to, to answer your question, I have not explored that, but it, is a re but, but it is definitely a reasonable idea. The big issues that you have at this point are that on these sensor microcontrollers, you only have 48K of memory, I mean 48K of RAM, I'm sorry, ROM, to do everything. I mean the 10K of RAM can be shared, but so you don't want to overload it with, too many algorithms um, at, at, at once, but the, 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 the microcontrollers are expanding, and there's a lot of new possibilities that's going to open up. And this is this. this, this oh yes, based yeah. on the number of pre-transmissions. Oh yes, yes, and, it's, it's, and, yeah, and you can and you can add all these all these factors in and um, and kind of move from there. And there's there, there's there's a lot of cool things you're going to be able to do with compression in the future. Um, so. If, I mean, yeah, if you have any other questions, so, yeah, please let me know. Because at this point, I'm going to transition off of compression and kind of introduce some of my newer work, which had to do with uh, communication-centric uh, data abstraction. I don't know if this qualifies as a brief introduction uh, anymore, but, uh, it, it, it's, but it's not going to go in, it, as in-depth in as I did in the uh, previous section of the talk. Um, yeah, go ahead. So in the beginning, you said that your thesis explores three different parts, three different ways in which you can save energy, right? That's yes. the application, the network, as well as the system. Correct. So in your experience, which, uh, which optimization gave you the most benefits? Um, in terms of, uh, okay, so the, so, so the question here is, uh, actually, that should probably, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat since we're on camera. But uh, yeah, so the question here is, out of the three that I looked at, of the, the three main system um, areas of energy conservation, um, which provided the most energy savings. And I think what it comes down to here is that, I mean, there, there, there's a lot of trade-offs to look at. I mean, the system-specific energy savings um, can give you a very quick cut and dry um, you know, uh, energy savings in terms of resource constraints. Um, but there's pros and cons to using those. And then, like, for application-specific compression, you don't see some of the dramatic energy savings. You're not going to see, I mean, well, at least... Uh, sorry, not application specific. The, uh, the the generic application level compression algorithms that I looked at, like SLZW, you might be. I mean, for a more application specific approach, you're probably going to be able to beat that. But it's nice. It's simple. It's very transferable. I can plug it into uh, to pretty much any system. So. Um, so I'm just wondering whether we so, should be focusing on. There should be more focus on radio optimizations to save power as opposed to looking at application. How much benefit? I have does the same that? question. Okay. At the same time, question. Are there any uh, hardware layer questions explored for looking at energy savings? So, in terms of the hardware layer and, uh, and the, 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 hard, the hardware layer savings, we did not look at those. We, 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 we bought these radios more off the shelf. But I could sit here and talk for an hour about ways I'd improve that radio in terms of uh, what it can do and what information it could provide. Because, I mean, for a sensor network, um, it, it, in terms of radio, if I was going to go back and do some more optimizations there, I'd actually dumb down the radio a little bit. I mean, the extend radio does a lot for you. Packets that come that are corrupt just kind of disappear. I'd like to have more of an indication other than maybe, a, maybe the, like the hardware counter of what changed there. Maybe I'd have it do some less processing and let, a, you know, and, and let the sensors figure it out. Because you can take this information. If you have more information on the hardware layer, you can take it and translate it across, as you were talking about, in terms of, uh, uh, of optimizing from that point of view. Um, but yes, so that's. 
have I have I answered your question at this point? Have I okay, cool. Thanks. That's a uh, hmm. cool. Okay. So as I shift gears a bit, essentially what it comes down to is comp compression does provide exciting energy benefits, but it doesn't do everything, especially when we start looking at mobile networks. There's still a lot of questions that were left unanswered. Um, and that's where it comes down to. Where else can we save energy? What else can we do? Um, and part of it comes down to some of the need. When you start looking at mobile networks, there's a lot of needs that it has in terms of uh, uh, that, that compression just isn't going to, uh, that it isn't going to address. Um, one of the primary ones is we need a way to name and identify data. Um, and part of this comes down to the fact is that data profile is constantly changing. Um, you're taking readings every 10 minutes, 5 minutes, or however often you're, t you're, you're, you're taking them. Um, you're, you're putting them in flash. And this data is going to be transmitted around. We need a way to acknowledge, especially in a sparse, delay-tolerant network, uh, we need a way to acknowledge it that's going to reach a base, because probably it's likely going to be moved through a, some sort of store and forward mechanism. Um, there's going to be a disconnect. There might even be multiple copies of the data in the network, because you're, you're trying to balance latency and energy requirements. Um, uh, nodes might send the multiple neighbors in an effort to get it back to the base station faster. So what we need is some way to track the, we need a way to track data through the network. Um, in terms, uh, so that we can uh, prevent retransmissions of data that have already re been, uh, been received at the base station, make sure that the, uh, the source and they keep sending, make sure that data moving along alternate paths does not, uh, d is not retransmitted and, and, uh, and propagated through the network. It'll save us both bandwidth and energy. We also want mechanisms for data search. Um, it'd be really nice to know what's on the node. Internally, we want to be able to find data that's already on the node, know what we have, especially as like acknowledgments are moving around. Externally, we might just want to answer queries. Um, part of the way through a sensor deployment, it'd be very easy to decide that you don't want all the data anymore, um, or you don't want all the data that you've been getting anymore, um, and you just want a subset. You just want a couple of answers. So maybe you, maybe you want to shift in terms of queries. We also want to be able to, I mean, I say this, so we're building a, a structure. We want to be able to integrate these compression and data reduction algorithms that I've been talking about. Um, since it's an autonomous system, I mean, we've been talking about doing uh, compression at the application level, just something that's kind of tagged on. If this could be integrated into a system so that after the application compresses data, it's automatically compressed and handled by the system, that would be extremely nice. So what I've proposed is a system that's designed to reorganize data from the network's point of view. Um, and what do I mean by that? Essentially, well, um, we have a lot of sensor networks have things like file systems. Uh, file systems are very good at what they're intended to do. Um, they're, you know, they're good at ensuring data integrity. They're, ensu they're good at ensuring that the physical memory is used correctly. Um, they're good at doing uh, at file management, but they're not so good at some of these uh, at some of these other tasks, like identifying distinct chunks of data. Um, so what I want to do is just add a data abstraction level, a uh, data abstraction layer um, between the application and the file system. Just something uh, our data abstraction layer called Dolly. Um, and the idea is that the application can write sensor data just like it would write to a file. Um, and this data abstraction layer can break it up into a two-tiered um, data hierarchy. The top layer being extremely easy to identify in the network. Um, the bottom layer being uh, easy to, trans uh, to compress and transmit. And for some numbers, I mean, we're using a 16-bit processor. What we can do is we can take these down here. We can break them. We, we, we can break this top layer into 16 pieces. And each of these 16 pieces can be around 500 bytes a piece. And if we work backward around 500 bytes, that's exactly what we were working with on the compression algorithm. Um, it makes it easy, and and so, and and down at this data abstraction layer can write additional layers, additional information to our file system to uh, to help us out. For example, we can write identification headers. The identification headers at both layers can help us create these portable acknowledgments that I was talking about. Um, we now will have some way to identify distinct chunks of data. It can also take metadata, um, information about summaries uh, of the data that's been collected that we can use for search. And I'm going to talk about both the, uh, the portable acknowledgments, or, or what I'll call the elite lists, and um, this drill down search structure that's created by having two, a two layer hierarchy of data with metadata um, uh, through this talk. And additionally, the data abstraction layer obviously stores the sensor data, but it can I integrate compression. So it can store, it, it can store data in, uh, in uncompressed versions and compressed versions. Um, uncompressed versions facilitate search, compressed versions um, uh, make it readily available for transmission. This can all be done offline. And as we're getting more and more flash, it's worth, it's, it, it's worth storing all this data to, um, uh, it, it's worth storing extra data to help us save energy um, over the radio. So 
this has been somewhat vague and cryptic, so let's talk some about, about the application, exactly what I'm talking about here. Let's move into delete lists, um, how we can prevent unnecessary transmissions. And I, I, essentially, what we've got essentially um, is we've, we've got, we've got a, a, a way now, based on this hierarchy, to identify data. We know the node, and these numbers are more like implementation specific. They can change some, but for this example, we've got a node ID. We can identify the, the source. We know when it started collecting the data. We'll have some sort of start, uh, start time, you know, whether that's a local data counter, whether that is, um, uh, whether that's a global um, synchronization counter, if you've, or a global time if you've got GPS. Um, and we can add some sort of application, you know, application file counter, just some unique file counter. And what these do is that they form a unique, identif a unique identifier for each block of data. Um, and once you have that unique uh, identifier, you also can add on a bit mask. So now you have your, 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 your top layer in your hierarchy that's been labeled and uniquely named. We can add a bit mask on, very, something very similar to identify the individual segments underneath at our bottom layer of our, uh, uh, of our tier. And what essentially this allows us to do is it allows us to identify any 512 byte block or any about 500 byte block of data in the system with just a 10, by, uh, 10 byte entry. And this translates directly to energy savings because if we can use a 10 byte, if we can send out a 10 byte entry to identify data rather than having to, um, uh, rather than have it, uh, to summarize it, we can actually prevent unnecessary transmissions. And if we kind of look, we can look at energy savings as a product of this ETX byte again. The energy is required to transmit a byte. Um, and we can look at it along two other axes in terms of the packet reception rate. Obviously, we're, getting, we're saving more and more energy as we start dropping packets because it's a lot easier to send 10 bytes than it is to send 500 bytes. And the number of blocks removed, and the, the blocks are you know, between 0 and 16 um, down here per module. Mm, excuse me. <coughs> so, sorry, and the number of, the, the number of blocks removed, the, the, the components of our higher level data tier, we, we, because we've been looking at, like, say, 500 byte um, blocks on the smaller end up to these, those 8K modules, which are easy to identify. Now, the biggest concern when you start looking at a system like this is that you're going to, is that 8K is not a, not a really huge amount of data. Um, over time, these are going to accumulate, and these delete list entries themselves um, could flood the network. So, but essentially, oh yes, sorry, that's a, yeah, this gives us nice energy savings up to you know no absolute worst case scenario we're saving the max amount of blocks around 170x. But if we start looking at um, the fact that these accumulate over time. The nice thing is that we can actually change the structure slightly and make an easy way to, uh, to coalesce these entries, to merge them into, uh, I into larger entries that will, um, uh, uh, that will minimize the amount of data that has to be transmitted through the network and amplify our energy savings even further. And so if we replace, once we have the entire module, once we have that entire top level in our, in our data hierarchy, what we can do is we can replace that bit mask that, that I talked about with just the end time. I mean, the end time can be derived directly from the data as it's been received. And what you can get is you can kind of line these things up and merge them together. So now we can merge uh, a couple of, uh, of entries. Now we've, we've moved to the, 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 into one. And so now we, we're, and, and now we, um, sorry, this makes our delete list entries expandable and helps us save additional energy through the network. Um, so in addition to these delete list entries, I also want to talk about, you know, we, uh, this, uh, the, the drill down search structure that, that, that I'm proposing here um, and what's inside. How do you deal Sorry? with wrap around? In the previous example you gave, oh, so yes. what's the maximum time, what's the time unit and how do you deal with oh, okay. that? So I mean, the time unit becomes very system specific, optimis it becomes somewhat system specific. The way I did it in this one is that I uh, measured, uh, I had a four byte counter of seconds. And so two to 32 seconds, I think I translated into four years. Um, so honestly, I haven't dealt with wrap around. Um, I don't know. I mean, if, if that, that, that might be something to, to look at in the future, but I mean, yeah, but that kind of latency, you won't get that kind of latency. Exactly. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't see that being a problem with these times. Yeah, but it depends what kind, what granularity you want these times, in, right? If someone's dealing in microseconds, all of a sudden you could wrap around could be a serious problem. That's true, but I mean, when you start collecting data in a, on the order of microseconds, I mean, these timestamps are going to be uh, are, are going to be more applicable to well, actually. Let me, uh, let me start. So one of the things is that they, it's, it's more applicable to the, to the data in the entire blocks. So you're looking at about 8K of data on how fast things move. But the other thing is that a timestamp really isn't that essential. I like the timestamp because I'm going to show in the next, uh, you know, or actually I don't, I don't know if I show in the next couple of slides. But the system can actually improve its search times by exploiting timestamps. 
However, you could just use a standard counter here. As long as you have some sort of unique name that makes it easy to, uh, to identify the data, even if I had just it's like start time and end time were one, and then on this one it was start time and end time were two, now you have, you have merged them together, the start and the end time become, um, you know, the start time becomes one, end time becomes two. It's still mergeable. Really, the, what, what you want to make sure is that no two segments of data have the same name. It's just that your system needs to deal with large latencies, right? Because it's, that is for correct. example, the Zebra network that you talk about, it's like Zebras are mobile and really mobile. Yes, yes. I mean, we could That's be looking at month-long latencies. Yeah. Right. That, that, that is correct. And these are the type of things that have to be balanced when you start looking at the implementations themselves. So, okay. So, I want to move over from here into this, the, into this drill-down search structure, which is essentially, you know, uh, using the same data organization, how can we facilitate search? And es essentially what we want to do, as I said, we, I want to take summaries of the block and the metadata le uh, levels to refine searches, make faster responses to queries. Because queries are going to happen in an online fashion. You can collect these data summaries offline, store them, we have the flash. I mean, and, and, if, and, if we, and, the, and the flash, uh, sorry, the flash is going to keep getting bigger. It's going to, you know, we're going to get more size, we're going to have less energy. So flash is in a worry here. But the queries, the queries do matter because when you have two, especially mobile nodes, two mobile nodes come into contact with one another, if you have a brief encounter, you want to maximize the effectiveness of that brief encounter. If you have a long encounter, you want to, you want to minimize your radio energy. You don't want to have it spend a lot of time um, with the radios on searching. So that's why, so that's why I mean, so, so really speed matters. Um, and, that, I mean, and that's the ultimate goal when we start looking at being able to, to take these summaries ahead of time. And, and it all comes down to essentially efficient use of bandwidth. So if we look at an example of, of the types of data we might collect, if you look at, let's look at a very, very simple sensor, something that's collecting temperature and humidity. Um, it's got, oh yeah, that int, yeah, long int. This is, this is designed for a 16-bit processor when you start looking at the uh, C++ data types. You, maybe you collect the maximum, minimum, and the, um, and the sum of all three. I mean, I'm sorry, of both of those. And then the number of, the number of entries. The number of entries in the block or in the module um, combined with the sum makes it very easy to, to compute averages. Um, and, you know, and so, it's, uh, and essentially what happens is that for, you, had, you, were, you were looking at, for, for a data size this, you're looking at 64 entries inside of a block, 124 entries, sorry, 1,024 entries inside of a module, and you're only spending about 18 bytes on each. So it's obviously quicker to read. 18-byte uh, entry than it would be to read, uh, you know, th th than to, to read eight um, kilobytes of, da of data. So, what we can do is let's just say we wanted to find, find me a, a reading with a temperature between uh, 50 and 60 degrees, and essentially, you know, in this is where you get your drill down mechanism. So let's look for things that have a maximum temperature greater than 50 and a minimum temperature less than 60, so that it might possibly be in there. So we take our summaries, we look at our module level. Uh, the first module, maybe min and max, are 40 and 48. There's no point in even looking in this. So we can read 18 bytes and then just skip over that whole section of data. We don't need to read it anymore. We can move over. We can look at the next module. Well, we want to find something with a temperature between 50 and 60. Given a min and max of, you know, given this example, min and max 54 and 46, it might be in here. So let's, now let's drill down. So we can actually come and look at this at the block level. Um, and we can start scanning the metadata on each block. It's still easier to read 18 bytes out of flash and process that than it is to read 64 entries or a 512 byte block. Um, this first block had a min, you know, just, and this is like I said, this is just a completely hypothetical example. Min and max don't fit in here. Um, the second one was looking at 40, 40, 47 to 48. Well, it's obviously this is going to help us here. Third block, maybe it's in here, 48, you know. It, we, we have a range here, 49 to 52. So maybe it's in there. Then we actually drill down into the, into the sensor data. And one point that I should make is that this works equally well for both spatial and, tempor and traditional data. I mean, this is a more traditional data set, but we can look at GPS locations, spatial data, with the same types of bounding boxes. Instead of having a one-dimensional bounding box of min and max, you now have bounding boxes for latitude and longitude. And so and actually did this. So when I, 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 we, I mean, I built the system on the, on the ZebraNet nodes using, we used a, a slightly newer version of the Flash, but still the same MSP430 microcontroller. And I looked at this through, through two different data sets. Um, one was a data set was a trace of the Appalachian Trail, uh, and one was the Great Duck Island data set, where I took a, a metadata from a subset of the readings. 
And the first thing to note is that versus having to actually read through all this data on Flash, you have more than, a, uh, more than order of magnitude improvement before you've made any optimizations. If you just do a very simple um, uh, search, as we start to look through here, as, as you start searching this module number on the x-axis here is the, is the number of 8K blocks that I had to search through to find the data. And then on the y-axis, you have just basic search time. Um, for a linear search, you actually have to read through all the sensor data. There was no organization. Um, but for, for this, we, we were able to use this drill down search structure to improve time. But you can also take this a step further and start looking at, at, at more complex, more realistic um, uh, queries, essentially spatially aware queries. And what this, what this graph shows is, a, is as an example, essentially, or we want to search for all the locations and times when the temperature was in a given range. This is the type of actually useful query on a mobile node. Um, where were you, and, you know, and when, you know, if, if we want to go back to our, our, 40 to, I mean, our 50 to 60 uh, degrees Celsius or, or degree Fahrenheit, wherever you were, um, where were you when it was in that temperature? Maybe you weren't outside. Maybe you were inside comfortably in a, uh, in a room. And what this graph shows here is that I searched through the data. You were using both the Appalachian um, Trail data and the GDI data here. And um, we have this, this search hit number on the, bo on the, on the bottom, which is just, it had, to go th it had to go through all the data, you know, find a, it had to find a, uh, a temperature in the range, and then it found the location. And the very first one, you know, it, it has to do the drill down search. It looks at the module headers, it looks at the block headers, it drills down into the uh, sensor data, finds a reading. Um, and so there's an initial overhead getting this started, you know, and it's, it's, it's more for temperature because the temperature over here, um, it, it only had a range of readings. Um, but at that point, it finds a temperature, it finds a time, it uses that timestamp to access the GPS data, makes it, it, which speeds up the, the search even more. Um, the next thing to know is that the, the hits tend to come in groups because once the data has been read into RAM, you know, once you've read these blocks of data, once you've read the sensor data into RAM, search is extremely quick. Um, so it's just a nice general feature of search, just, just, just something to keep in mind. And then, you know, over time, you have to move between, blo uh, between blocks and modules as you move between groups of hits. Um, and so you can have you know, reasonable search times moving through. But this is, this is just designed to give you some idea of the functionality behind the uh, DALI system. Um, so that was just a very brief introduction into what I was doing. I didn't want to go too, too into depth because I guess I've been up here for about an hour at this point and uh, open up the field to questions. But in summary, essentially, Reorganizing data from the network perspective can have a proud, uh, profound effect on mobile community. Oh, sorry? There's a quick question on the side, uh, on your last slide. Yeah. So you sort of expect people to know what kind of story they're going to post before they do the summary. Correct. Now, and, and, and part, of, part of what's in the paper is that, I mean, because for this system, we had, uh, I anticipated the types of, the types of queries, because the types of search algorithms were, were written in. And actually, you can improve on search times. What I find is that the more you know, the, the faster your search can, uh, can work out. For example, if I want to summarize, I mean, this was all very data-centric because I want to be able to move the data. I want to have the option of being able to answer queries or just move all the data al al along those lines. So, you know, so we kept the blocks and the modules were defined by data sizes, not by more um, human recognizable characteristics like the data over a given day. But we can actually go back through and pre-generate additional metadata summaries. And this is the type of thing that I didn't... Uh, really go into here, but, you can, but if you know that you want to get the average temperature over a day, you can actually pre-compute this and, and, and store it locally. But it was not designed to try to dynamically um, create search algorithms. This also, is, there are certain queries may or may not be able to do this kind of stuff. Kind of maybe median or something that you have to go through all the, all the blocks to, to, to Oh. What I mean is, there are certain query it's, it's not aggregatable. Oh, uh, okay, uh, correct. So yeah, there, there, are, there, are there are certain uh, general queries that are not going to be aggregatable, but you might be able to help yourself out a little bit in terms of, I mean, like, I guess me a, a median query would be an example of an extremely difficult one to do on a sensor network. I think you're, I mean, uh, there, there, there are, there, there have been works um, that, I've, that I've looked at briefly that have tried to, uh, to help mitigate this process, but I don't, yeah, I, I, I don't know if the, uh, if Dolly would actually be able to help out a median. But you could do, I mean, essentially, you know, yeah, yeah means and, uh, and those type of things that can be helped out with our data summaries. Can you give a kind of a 10,000 foot overview of total energy consumption? Uh, you're say, you know, you say, you say so many X here, so many X there. 
um, MSP430 is a fairly efficient processor. What about the overall scheme of things? The GPS radio, uh, your, your regular radio, what your duty duty cycle is. Is this real significant savings or does it pale, say, in comparison to the GP, GPS radio cold start or, or your radio transmit or your, running your sensors or whatever? Okay, so, so the question here is a, um, well, what is the 10,000 foot overview of the actual energy consumption of the system? Three to um, five days doesn't seem very long for batteries around that size neck collar that I saw in the picture. Oh, yes. I don't know anything any, okay. any, any more about it. Okay, so, so, so on ZebraNet, now, I mean, so, so that graph was somewhat specific to ZebraNet for a couple of reasons. One was that we were using a uh, two amp hour lithium ion battery. Um, and that was just, just a single rechargeable battery. The idea was to keep the weight of the collar down because you don't want to endanger the, the, the animal itself. Um, but the other thing is that, so the GPSs too are getting more energy efficient. We were using, I mean, between the two deployments, we actually got a, a, a new GPS um, module that reduced energy consumption by about an order of magnitude. Um, so how does that compare, say, with the energy consumption of the MSP430? Oh, okay, so, so in terms of... Um, I just want a, a general comparison. Are you nickel and diming algorithms where maybe your sensor just completely swamps the uh, energy consumption? Okay, so, well, so, so the answer to your question is, if I let the radio, the radio will completely overwhelm the system. The radio is so far and about, I mean, to I'll give you some general power numbers. The radio, when it's transmitting on this, is uh, at 500 milliwatts, is actually consuming 2.4 watts. Um, and so the GPS is consuming about 60 milliwatts. The MSP is consuming about 5 milliwatts. Um, so, the MS, so the GPS is an order of magnitude above the, uh, the, the microcontroller, although the microcontroller has to be on longer. But I mean, the issue with GPS is, is, uh, is on time and, and lock duration. We are finding every eight minutes it needed to be on about 40 seconds for that. That's a warm, that's a warm start. Mm -hmm. Correct. And that's, I mean, and that's in, it, it, it varies when you start looking at this GPS module. It's got to get the ephemeris data. So it's it's got to get the, the, the data from the satellite so where they're going over the next about four hours or so. Um, when it needs almanac data, that's just that, that only happens every every month or so. Kind of throw that aside. But realistically, I mean, when you it, it, as the network comes together, I mean, the, the, even the, the radio idle energy is ten times that of the uh, GPS. So the radio really, I mean, if, if we start, the, the radio was only sixty five percent because um, because we limited it. We only let it turn on. It was very every eight minutes it turned on briefly. And the reason it turned on briefly is that, well, because it turns on every two hours to communicate with other nodes. It sends out peer discovery messages. We found that trying to follow a zebra for two hours was awful um, and, and, and uh, a horrible, horrible thing. So we optimized things by, because uh, you have to follow it with a handheld unit to try to take the information off of it. That's just not fun. Um, so in terms of user interface, we had built it so that they would turn on very briefly every eight minutes. But if we were to have them, say, turn on every eight minutes to send up peer discovery messages, that would change. I mean, that, that would start to weigh things even more toward the radio. Um, and as that radio collects more and more information, as the network becomes more and more saturated, it's collecting information in isolation. Um, the, the, the radio weighs even, even more in that spectrum. So I'm, I'm very confident to say that the radio is where I want to spend my time and my energy. Um, I mean, I worked on optimization. Minimizing on time. Yeah, exactly. Minimizing, minimizing on time, exactly. Minimizing on time and volume of transmissions. Um, okay, so yeah, so to wrap, to, so, so, so as I wrap things up here, um, you know, just yes, yeah, so reorganizing data can have a profound effect on mobile communications since we can eliminate, you know, we can have the acknowledgements, we can eliminate data from the network that doesn't need to get to be there, and this comes back to, yeah, it's the less you have to transmit, the better. Um, and then, you know, so yeah, so we can eliminate this, I mean, so it just saves tremendous amounts of energy. And then this drill down search structure can improve search times so by more than an order of magnitude, can facilitate multiple application searches and give us, uh, and, and at least help us some with, uh, with spatially aware searches. Um, so if we take one step back in terms of my general thesis contributions, the thesis part was, was, was threefold. We started looking at the application uh, level compression, SLZW, we looked at before. We just talked some about Dolly and its. Um, uh, identifiable data segments, drill down uh, search algorithms, and data reduction algorithms, or well, at least the way you can, in fact, you can incorporate data reduction. All right, I need to pop up to the penthouse again for 10,000 foot view. Yep. When you're talking about an X, you're talking about overall energy consumption over some baseline, right? Or just, just the energy consumption within a, a node processing, or what? Um, so yeah, so when I, when I look at it from compression uh, and, and uh, network energy savings from the 10,000 viewpoint, I'm talking about an X, I'm talking about all, all, all throughout the network. Um, 
Both locally. Oh, everything else. Correct. GPS. Uh, yeah. Oh, so no. So when I, when I talk about this, it's, I, I'm comparing throughout the network in terms of of radio, because um, the sensors are interchangeable. I pull GPS out. I pull GPS out of the equation for this because, like, ZebraNet did GPS, and that was a uh, more, and, and that was. Um, I mean, for this application, GDI used sensors. The Great Duck Island sensor scope. They used sensors that were like three orders of magnitude less energy. So for a fair comparison, I pulled those out. But the radio is king here. Correct. Yeah. The, ra the, ra the radio is, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I, the, the, ra the radio is where I want to spend my time. So, okay, so we looked at this, and then I looked at, like, some system-specific energy uh, management techniques, across layer optimizations, um, and that had to do with, yeah, how can you do, how, how can you make parts of the system work together to save energy, save resources? And the other thing was quality of service trade-offs. This is where I did my GPS work. Um, it, it, and th th this is uh, somewhat old, but essentially, there is a, uh, a significant trade-off between GPS energy and, uh, and accuracy um, because you use the GPS differently than, um, you, humans use the GPS differently than the sensor wants to. Human's going to turn it on, it's going to get a reading, you're going to sit there, you're going to watch it, it's going to have time to adjust, it's got feedback mechanisms to improve the lock accuracy. Um, sensor wants to turn it on, get the first reading that it thinks is good and shut it off. Well, from our experiences, that first reading is off by like kilometers. I mean, I, I strapped a, a GPS to the, to the roof of the building, and the building was moving like a mile in each direction. Um, that was not fun. So essentially, you, uh, uh, but there are, there are aspects of the GPS signal uh, um, that you can use to ensure that you have good locks. And that's where I start talking about quality of service trade-offs for ZebraNet, and there's quality of service tra trade-offs in general for sensors. Um, you start looking at communications and networks. So um, thank you all for coming today. Do you have any more questions? So... You look at lossless compression in the, uh, in the spectrum. Uh, for many of these applications, uh, the sensors themselves are noisy, and they may or may not make sense or, or, or be the best approach to do lossless compression. If you are allowed to do lossy compression to a certain degree, what's your intuition about the energy savings? Is it worth to doing that? Or Okay, so the question here is, um, I mean, since some, since some sensors are noisy, lossy compression might be, might, might be beneficial as well. What, are the, what kind of energy savings do you see with lossy compression? Well, and the answer is I've looked at this uh, to, to some extent in a, on, on a couple of variables. Um, lossless compression is nice because any one of us can just pick it up and snap it on. It's not application specific in any, ma in any manner. But you can save um, uh, in terms of um, lossy compression in a couple of ways. Um, one has to do with the fact that you can reduce the you can reduce the accuracy. Um, essentially, you, you, know, you truncate readings. Um, if you only care about temperature to you know if you don't care about temperature to three decimal points, so maybe you truncate it down to uh, down to one um, or sorry one decimal place, no decimal places. And through that, I saw like reasonable energy. I mean, I looked at this in terms of GPS, and I saw reasonable energy savings in terms of like like an additional ten to twenty percent. Um, the other way that you can do this is through something like differentials, um, where you can start, you know, I, I, I mean, well, and, and this is simple, essentially. What is the difference between this reading and the next reading? And this folds back into accuracy. You can try to round things to, uh, to work from there. And that's all uh, about the same energy savings as SLZW, but they could be merged. Um, SLZW would work after this. Now, an additional, additional lossy compression methods, um, uh, you start to look at the possibilities of aggregation. I mean, other people have seen um, extremely large energy savings. If you don't, I mean, uh, but I think that the main thing that you can do with with, with this is a lot of on-node filtering, a lot of on-node processing. I mean, like if you start talking about temperature variations, maybe you only send it when it when it varies. You know, maybe you only send the data when the temperature changes by like two or three degrees, um, and that can help you just on the communication front in general. It just happens to be more application specific. Thank you all for coming.